Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, and this is your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we're asking the question, does overregulation drive black market cannabis sales? And then a headset report on how to survive the increasingly competitive cannabis industry, according to data written by the CEO of Cy Scott. On the line with us is our CBD correspondent, Dan Chemist with Good CBD Products. So this Benzinga article asks a question, if overregulation drives black market sales, I'll just say right off the bat that you're asking if the egg came before the chicken black market or the, uh, the legacy market has been around first. So once regulation came in, they're the ones trying to grab sales, not the other way around. So the article goes in to say, quote, the quantitative analysis of new reports reveals that regulation is one of the main reasons that people stay in the illicit markets. The comparison of cannabis crimes uh, have mixed findings. And the reasons behind the persistence of the black market are complex. One of the main arguments is that legalization states have failed to establish a regulatory framework, which effectively keeps both producers and consumers in the legal market. Instead, strict regulations and high costs of compliance have created the, an environment in favor of big players while driving small scale businesses into the black market. The fact that Washington's marijuana black market kept growing after the implementation of more complex and sophisticated regulations at least indicates a correlation between regulation intensity and the increase of the black market in the case of Washington. Regulation and legislation around cannabis that creates an even playing field for all playing fields is just as important. Otherwise, the country might find itself in a worse vaping crisis than the one we found ourselves in right now. So with that, we've had 12 deaths. Washington State is about to ban all vaping products today. That hasn't even come out yet. Um, but with the argument of overregulation driving black market cannabis, I would say that uh, higher regulations, higher barriers to entry do create black market. But what you don't see is people selling cigarettes out of their trunks or even bathtub gin. So I would disagree and just say that the, the legacy market has been here a lot longer and it's going to take uh, cheaper uh, that means lower taxes, lower prices, and better quality. Otherwise, that legacy market is going to remain the fundamental base while regulated markets try to take away that market share. Mm, you know, one of these interesting situations where, okay, the reaction to uh, the serious crisis, a series of bans, and yet take something away, make it, you know, all the more sought after and something that can then be you know, that that ban can be leveraged, right? So I don't know, man. I, uh, you know, with regards to cannabis, let's face it, there's a myriad of issues with regards to, um, you know, it's not just the cannabis you're vaping, okay? It's the additives and it's the concern around the additives. And then, uh, you know, even some of the things that people use to uh, fertilize, you know, their cannabis, can end up being a real serious issue with regards to later in the supply chain if you're vaping it, right? So it's one of those things that on the surface looks really simple, but you start digging in and there are so many different issues. So, you know, I'm not sure where I fall on it yet, Gronick. I will say this. I, uh, you know, I really do. The, the, the way the shoe is dropped with regards to the vaping thing, you know, and Again, to, to see it to the where we're breaking news on the show about stuff like a band coming, zany, really zany, sad. Yeah, I think you were referring to Eagle 20 and herbicide that when combusted is a carcinogen. And there's other things, you know, if you don't know chemistry, I don't, you know, I'm finance. But if, uh, if a chemist knew that uh, vitamin E oil, when heated up, turns into cyanide, they probably wouldn't add that. So that's probably why there's regulation. Um, but again, it, there's going to be bankruptcies. We've said that before. There's going to be fallout from this as Washington bans all vape products. There's an interesting uh, statistic out there where if you have 15 SKUs or more, 60% of them will be profitable. And on the flip side, now don't quote me on this, but I think that if you have 15 products or less then 60% will not be profitable. But the point is, is that in order to remain uh, you, a going concern or, or living another day, you have to have multiple products. And we saw that in Oregon when they initiated their, their re regulation where all solvents 
were uh, were banned. And so anybody who made rosin made a killing. They did really well. And so again, it, it's going to be a matter of a lot of companies that were uh, white labeling. That's all they did. They're going to be struggling in order to uh, you know pay be- the bills and rent and, and everything else because there is no deadline on this. There's this is a ban, and we don't know what's going to happen and how long. Well, and is it a domino? Right. Again, this is the thing is, you know, we say it all the time on the show. Got to have a war chest. Okay. Got to have a big war chest. Really better. You know, if you're entering the market and you have a plan, yeah, you better have several different, you know, uh, plan B, plan C, plan C2, et cetera. Right. Because again, um, this turbulence, you know, again, if you're running fat right now, this is just another day in the cannabis industry. If you're running in the margin, there are so many different tendrils of small business where today, you know, this kind of thing, the impact in it is is literally, uh, again, it's existential for your business. So how do you survive in this increasingly competitive cannabis industry? Headset has a report according to data. Cy Scott wrote this uh, a year ago. Um, and so kind of keeping that in mind, as I read this, I'll sort of uh, make an update in terms of pricing, for example, he says that historically, uh, we've seen prices as low as 20 cents. But when he wrote this in June of 2018, that wasn't harvest season. And last harvest season, we saw prices as low as seven and eight cents per gram. Uh, so I'll just make some updates. But according to Cy Scott, he says that the industry is growing by leaps and bounds. Over half the U.S. has legalized some form of medical cannabis, while nine states, well, it's now 11, enjoy full use legalization. All of Canada is set to enjoy recreational cannabis. Um, that's 2.0. And then, however, it's fun to read the reports about the potential size of the new market. It doesn't always tell the whole story. The can't, uh, at first, maybe the product just sells itself, but the novelty wears off pretty quickly. And Headset, they've gotten to watch the industry evolve in real time via the data they collect from their partners in cannabis retailers and production. They launched Headset, a data-driven business analytics firm specifically designed to meet the needs of the cannabis industry in 2015 tracking their home market of Washington state. They track data across the country, but they're capturing about 75% of every dollar transaction in Washington. So the data sets they've built there are really strong. From studying it, they've gained some fascinating insights about what a maturing market looks like and what it takes to carve out a foothold in it. These are ones that they think are the most important, and they hope that entrepreneurs in emerging markets like Canada and California and globally will find them useful. So after initial excitement, growth plateaus, their data shows that almost an astronomical rate of increase in the early years in the Washington market, the recreational market started very small. It was essentially built from scratch rather than being based on an existing medical market like it was in Colorado. Growth rates were about 100% in 2015. That fell to about 33% in 2016. And then from 2017 to 2018, it grew about 10%. That's still a great growth rate, of course, but the trend is pretty easy to interpret growth cools off after the initial surge of activity, which benefits well-established businesses the most. Certain sectors and product categories still have a lot of growth potential, which they'll get into below, but overall growth tapers off as the industry wins over initially hesitant consumers and reaches a potential plateau. So we've always said that there's mover, first mover advantages. You gotta get in at, at first and, and look for an exit strategy, whereas a lot of people you know, in Washington are kind of running around and doing things. And it's, uh, it's an interesting Petri dish being here and seeing this, where we don't have home grow, where we don't have vertically integrated opportunities where the retail shops are separate. It's incredibly competitive, probably the most competitive market uh, anywhere in the country. Yeah, you know, when I go uh, rolling through Washington, one of the things I like to do is hit the strip over by my place. And uh, there's like, 18 weed stores down this, you know, 10 mile strip. Right. And again, it's fun as a consumer, but for business, it's really tricky. And what's funny about that is uh, each of these different jurisdictions are a little different. And this is why I so enjoy like headset, right? Because they are collecting data, you know, so uh, this is the thing when I'm in the field, I'm, I'm experiencing whatever I'm experiencing. If I'm at one store and they're selling a joint for $2, that doesn't mean that every store is selling a joint for $2, right? And that's where synthesizing what I do 
with what headset, you know, that, that information that headset has in, in hand, Greg. I love that. I love that. And so next on the list is what about prices? So as the market grows and settles, so do prices. At first, because supply is limited and the market's small, prices are pretty high. We've seen those prices drop over 2016, 2017, but eventually stabilize. However, while prices are lower overall, consumers are still spending about the same amount per transaction, $31 on average. The industry is delivering a lot more value to the consumer. However, that decreased cost to the consumer comes out of someone's pocket, and in Washington, it appears to be the producers. There are far more licensed producers and processors in Washington than retailers, creating something of a glut. As with any commodity, too much cannabis on the market means low wholesale prices, and we've heard of producers selling for as low as 7 to $0.08 cents a gram. Producers that are insulated from this a bit are ones who have developed a brand that resonates well with consumers, enabling them to ask more from retailers. Large producer processors operations who have a lot of different brands in their portfolio actually do very well in this market as they're able to bring in or grow a lot of product very cheaply, add value to it, and ask for better wholesale prices for that product. Having more SKUs and, you know, I think it's fair to say that in the the different jurisdictions, you know, watching these brands grow and evolve and and see the brands that start to set themselves um, apart, right? And then here in uh, Washington, or in like in this case, or in Oregon, um, the whole thing of um, looking for, because this is the thing, year to year, and this is what's kind of interesting about today's report, because it is a year old uh, from a data perspective, right? This industry, a year, in a lot of ways, feels like four or five. It's, It's crazy. It is just, so, you know, when I think back to a year ago, who were the strong brands relative to today? What's funny is there's some, but there's others that have really come on strong. It's, it's again, it's a fun market. So next up on this headset report is branching out is better. So they say, quote, as we hinted above, variety is key. Consumers start out buying almost exclusively flour. They estimate that 90% of sales in a new market will be flour. And with that figure will drop off significantly over time. Among the nine product categories they track, flour still accounts for over 50% of Washington sales, but the category has definitely given ground. And the products that continue to show high growth rates are niche ones like tinctures, topicals, and capsules. Companies looking to break into the market later in the game would do well to look outside of the flour category for producers with a long history in flour, uh, thinking early on about other ways to use that flower is wise, like, you know, unique uh, derivatives like CBG, CBN, THCV that we've talked about. Right. And, you know, aligning with folks who are going to make those awesome, you know, capsules or those, that diverse product line, right? Because that's the thing. There is a, uh, that curve, the predictability of that curve now, right? Where mm-hmm. in the beginning, yeah, a lot of straight up flour will sell. But again, over time, you'll start to see the uh, the consumer self-select their way. You know, your market might be different than mine. We might sell more pre-rolls here. You might sell more tincture over there. But in the end, there will be a curve and there will be a migration from a sales perspective where, yeah, on day one, you mainly sold baggies of grass. On day 1000, that's going to be different. And branding is big. So this article goes in to say that they mentioned that producers who brand well are protected from downward price pressure to some extent. Indeed, branding is a big part of success in the mature cannabis market. In Washington, the top 10 brands currently command 20% of the market. And that's just brands, not companies. So they estimate there's about 900 current operating producers in Washington. And many of the top producers have multiple brands. Successful brands also tend to have a lot of uh, products within their portfolio, so they're meeting every different need their consumer's base might have. Once they've won people over with product, they can keep them interested in the brands with other products. So what do some of the winners look like? Well, the top 10 brands in Washington all share similar characteristics. 
Distribution is one of them. In Washington, this state is divided into east and west sides of the Cascade Mountain Range, and the top brands have a solid retail presence on both sides. They all produce products in multiple categories from flour to edibles to pre-rolls and beyond. Perhaps most importantly, they all focus on building a consumer relationship with their brands, be it by commissioning custom art for their packaging or pushing to engage bud tenders who serve something like gatekeepers of the brand loyalty. Because cannabis brands can't depend on most social media to communicate with their customers, focusing on in-person marketing like the visual appeal of packaging or human interaction with bud tenders is crucial. Big brands do that very, very well. Data matters as well, and companies are making decisions based on data rather than hunches have a serious competitive advantage. I've also heard from retail partners that produce, uh, who use technology to manage logistics, they get preference. At least a few of the top brands who use their headset service, um, which is a, a vendor management inventory system designed for the cannabis industry and the buyers love them. And then lastly, something that they've noticed is that the best brands combine business savvy with a good understanding of cannabis culture Lots of entrepreneurs who came from the black or legacy market suffered uh, for a lack of business acumen, and lots of companies who came from outside cannabis communities have found it difficult to connect with consumers. The best companies can do both. Right, but we got to peel some data for a sec, okay? So you said, you know, something like the top 10 uh, have 20% of the biz, right? Hold that up and compare that to like soda, right? You know, the top like three or four or five brands have like, 85% of the business, right? Because that's where it's going. And that's the thing is that today, again, you know, if you're a brand and you actually have a fragmented share of market, geez, we've got, you know, 2% of the market, you're an awesome brand in the cannabis space. That's crazy, right? You're like, well, that doesn't feel that awesome. Right. But that's because it's the undiscovered country. It's the thing it, in the end, it's what's going to be the next big thing. Somebody is going to find a name. They're going to find a logo. They're going to be able to find consistency and they're going to have it ready for the day. It can go, you know, uh, from one farm all around the region and all of that, but it's not there yet. It's not there yet. It's really funny from the, the ground. CBD just took over uh, turmeric as the number one dietary supplement sold. So it's definitely becoming more normalized. Uh, and with data, it's just going to kind of show that emerging markets like Canada and, and California are just going to be on trend uh, with other states that we've seen onboarded. And using data from headset is absolutely beneficial definitely a way that first mover advantages can strategize think of an exit strategy because with multi-state operators keep moving forward that's their way of branding and expanding and scaling and with again first mover advantages they're going to be the ones to benefit the most so taking advantage of headset reports is going to be crucial for anybody else kind of coming on board so you have to come back to the talking hedge to find out what's next so with that we're going to roll this one up i'm josh Kincaid. this is the talking hedge don't forget to like share and subscribe or don't and i'm out